Nice to see everybody. I'm, I'm glad to see very many faces I've never seen before. Um, the kind of thing we need to do here, which is to expand our, our boundaries a bit. Uh, we're, we're the Jordan Center uh, for the University of Russia. And we've been very good at Russia in terms of humanities, social sciences. Uh, we've been very poor at Russia when it comes to the history of science and when it comes to mathematics in particular. Which is a pity, because NYU has strengths in these areas, the city has strengths in these areas, and somehow we're not able to have the conversation. And one of the things that I was very pleased about when, uh, when Xenia came along and proposed this, and Xenia, by the way, is the person who actually organized everything. So everything good that happens here, um, <laughs> everything good that happens here is thanks to me. And everything bad that happens, uh, Xenia is, is responsible for all the good things that are about to happen, and for bringing these people together. Um, and um, I think that um, the ongoing conversation we should be having is on two levels. Uh, one of them is the, the conversation about how we understand the history of science and maths uh, in the Soviet Union, in particular, and in the international context. And the other one is how these subfields can be related to other subfields. Uh, and I think there, we're, we're in a situation where we tend to be researching parallel to each other and rarely intersecting. And to me, this is a pity, personally, uh, as a historian, uh, because I think there's a lot that we have to learn uh, from, from other subfields. Um, I think there, there have been moments when the, when the different subfields have been intersecting, um, I, I, I was trained with Kendall Bales, meaning uh, reading Kendall Bales, not with Kendall Bales. Um, um, and I'm friends with people like uh, Kajivnikov and um, uh, uh, Jim Andrews. Um, and, um, and I'd like to see them more in my midst, and I'd like to see us more in their midst. So these are the parallel conversations I'd like us to have. Now, um, it's our job, of course, first and foremost, to stimulate exactly what it is that historians of science want to do. So it's not for us to come and tell any other subfield uh, how to go about it. That's already an achievement, in other words, if, if this can happen here. Uh, it would be nice to have that other conversation about how we can intersect in, 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 in more ways and how we can speak across the boundaries a little better. Um, that's all I have to say by way of introduction. Um, we have our first panel, uh, uh, and uh, the, the format will be something as follows. Who's is this? Oh, that's mine. That's your, I'll, I'll move in just a minute, okay? Sure. But I'm not going to lose this. Yes, that's <laughs> cool. yes. um, in terms of the format, um, th this is an intimate group, and I think we should capitalize on the intimacy, um, uh, which is to say that uh, uh, too stylized uh, a format is, is not useful always, and it's much better to have people give their comments. Uh, at, at the end of each paper, feel free to interject with quick factual questions and quick clarifications. Uh, in order to have, a, to have an ongoing conversation. Move on to the next panelist, quick clarifications, quick questions. Uh, I'll have some general comments at the end which are only meant to facilitate discussion. Um, uh, and everyone should feel free to jump in and, and have a conversation. So the, the more informal, the better. And the more focused on the ideas, the better. Um, did, you, did you all decide what order do you want to speak in? I have goals. goals. As it goes? Okay. Who's Brittany? Yeah, Brittany? Did you want to come up here? Sure. So Brittany is our first speaker. Um, I'm sure you have the program, but in case you don't, Mathematics Across the Atlantic and the Iron Curtain. Uh, Richard, Richard Courant in Academia in 1963. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me today, uh, telling you and seeing you and for organizing this, this conference. Um, so just to situate you with who I am and what I'm doing, I'm a doctoral candidate in history and sociology of science. Um, and I'll be presenting a part of my dissertation research today. My larger uh, project focuses on the cultural history of NYU's Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences. I'm interested in how the NYU mathematicians saw mathematics functioning as an object of cultural exchange. And I consider the social and cultural roles of mathematicians within society. In this respect, I ask how the NYU mathematicians, some of whom are here with us today, um, saw themselves as contributing intellectually within mathematics and science, and how that corresponded to their relationships with their peers in the government, military, and private foundations, and on a domestic and international level in academia. Over the history of the Krant Institute's development, beginning with Richard Krant's arrival in 1934 and its growth through sponsored projects by the Office of Scientific Research and Development during World War II, subsequent Office of Naval Research Contracts, the Atomic Energy Commission funded Supercomputing Center, and numerous grants from the Rockefeller Foundation, the NSF, and the Sloan Foundation, the Krant Institute mathematicians were part and parcel 
of their social, cultural, and political environment. An important element within the Kron Institute community has been its international character. Many of the mathematicians themselves came from all over the world, including Courant, who emigrated from Germany, and after a year in Cambridge, England, following his dismissal by the Nazis in 1933. Courant had received his PhD under David Hilbert in Göttingen, and later served as the director of the Mathematics Institute at Göttingen. At NYU, Krant and his colleagues strove to emulate the Göttingen Institute in many ways. They hosted numerous international scholars through its visiting members program, which began in the late 1950s, and the mathematicians themselves traveled widely. Krant, in particular, traveled with regular frequency, returning to post-war Germany every year following the war, traveling well throughout Europe, visiting colleagues and attending conferences, and later in his life, making several trips to the Soviet Union during the 1960s. Today, I would like to focus particularly on Krant's travels to the Soviet Union in the 1960s, with a special emphasis on the 1963 Joint Symposium on Partial Differential Equations. In this project, I ask how it came to be that Krant and his colleagues visited the Soviet Union. What were their motivations for doing so? From the perspective of these American mathematicians, how do they see the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the National Science Foundation, the <coughs> Energy Commission, and the Department of State's involvement? All of these were involved in some way in the negotiating, funding, approving, or organizing of these exchanges. Certainly, these mathematicians found themselves navigating a complex political environment, at times stressing the practicality and applications and usefulness of their mathematical research, while also stressing their role as cultural ambassadors in promoting peaceful relations. In fact, the Courant Institute alone at the time was operating on a nearly $3 million annual budget, mostly supported by government and military agencies and some private foundations, while also stressing the ability of their field to contribute to peaceful international relations. I'd like to explore this complexity of these factors within this historical moment. This work is greatly informed by a rich secondary literature in the history of science, including studies of scientific identity formation, particularly the works of John Kriegas, Slava Gerovich, Lauren Graham, Stuart Leslie, and Jessica Wong. Kron's first trip to the Soviet Union took place in the summer of 1960. Prior to the trip, he had been in contact with a number of Soviet colleagues, some of whom he knew from his time in Göttingen in the 1920s and early 30s. He saw a number of quote, both old and new friends at the 1958 International Congress of Mathematicians in Scotland. Among the new friends he met in Scotland was Sergei Sobolev, who was at the time from the Soviet Academy's Mathematics Institute in Moscow. Following the Congress, Krant maintained contact with Sobolev, who eventually visited the U.S. and was at the time involved in building the new academy at town outside of Nova Scotia in Siberia. In these exchanges, Kron and his Soviet colleagues would share journals, textbooks, music recordings, photographs of their trip to Scotland, and at times, invitations to each other's home institutions. The timing for Kron worked well. In the late 1950s, the Soviet and American governments had just signed an official scientific, technical, and cultural exchange agreement, which allowed for ballet companies, musicians, and athletes, for example, to tour each other's countries each other's countries, quote, in the hope that they will contribute significantly to the betterment of relations between the two countries. The exchange agreement also allowed for an inter-academy agreement between the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the Soviet Academy of Sciences. This agreement allowed for scientists to give and attend lectures, seminars, and conferences in each, other country, in each other's countries, all the while being monitored through visas, undergoing a long approval process and being conducted under strict rules of reciprocity. When Krant's first trip in 1960 to the Soviet Union was proposed, he wrote to the National Academy of Sciences expressing his interest as intellectual, wanting to further learn how mathematics can interact with the other sciences, particularly physics and engineering. He wrote, quote, it may be well that we can learn a lot from Russia, where such a tradition seems to be much stronger than it is here. My main interest is, of course, to see and to learn 
a little bit more of what animates Russian scientific life. He wrote a similar letter to his host, Sergei Sobolev, at the Soviet Academy of Sciences Mathematics Institute. <coughs> On his two week stay in the Soviet Union in the summer of 1960, Krant was accompanied by his younger colleague and former student, Peter Lacks, a Hungarian emigre who had done his PhD work at NYU. They spent most of their time in Moscow, but also three days in Leningrad and Teplis each. Krant attended lectures, seminars, and receptions, gave a series of lectures himself, and conducted many personal visits with colleagues at various institutes, including the large Soviet Academy of Sciences Computing Center in Moscow. Upon his return, Krant wrote a report on his observations of the Soviet Union, which was distributed among high-ranking officials of various American organizations and foundations. The report touched upon several themes, including his observations of the Soviet educational system and mathematical culture, which he found to share qualities he recognized <coughs> from his time in Germany. He was impressed by the, quote, first-rate inspiring leaders around whom groups and scientific schools grow organically, much as they existed in the old <coughs> pre-Hitler Germany and elsewhere in Europe. He added that a large number of leading scientists, quote, gained their original inspiration, at least partially, in the old German universities, such as Göttingen and Munich. He noticed that there was close collaboration between institutes, seminars were regularly attended by members of different fields, and there was a broad acceptance of applied mathematics, all features that he strove to foster from his own institute at NYU. But Karan's report did not just reflect upon the intellectual environment. He also described the social, political, and cultural environment commenting on, for example, the political climate, writing, quote, it appears that Russian scientists are much freer and less oppressed than many people outside suspect. Beyond just being an observer, Karat interpreted his own presence there as part of the political situation. Quote, my interest was primarily in the question of how scientific context can contribute to peaceful international relations. In the first days, my visit in the USSR was, at least psychologically, somewhat affected by the political crisis. I felt a certain reserve in my contact with administrators in the Soviet Academy. But very quickly, these clouds disappeared and a spirit of complete enthusiastic friendliness prevailed without reserve. In fact, Peter Lax's memory of Courant in his trip in 1960 is particularly striking. Lax reflected, Courant was deeply concerned about the Cold War. He felt that the natural comradeship of scientists and particular mathematicians might set an example and overcome the us versus them stereotypes. Accordingly, he was among the first to visit the Soviet Union. Lax continued, the time, the summer of 1960, was not auspicious, for the Soviets had just shut down a US spy plane. And in fact, there was potential that the trip was going to be canceled. They ended up going the last minute. I continue, continue quoting Lax, the remains of the plane and the spy paraphernalia were displayed in the middle of Moscow's Gorky Park. There was a long line of curiosity seekers. As a distinguished visitor, Courant was whisked to the head of the line and was introduced to the aeronautical engineer who was there to explain the workings of the U-2. The engineer was deeply honored. <laughs> the engineer was deeply honored, expressing Professor Courant, I learned aerodynamics from your book. <laughs> <laughs> Following the 1960 visit, Krant continued to correspond and share textbooks with Soviet colleagues, some of whom visited the U.S. during this time, including Sergei Sobolev from the Moscow Mathematics Institute as a guest of the American Mathematical Society. A few years later, the Soviet Academy of Sciences proposed a joint symposium on partial differential equations, which was eventually held in August of 1963 in the academy town just outside of Novosibirsk in Siberia, where Sobolev had been the director of the New Mathematics Institute, and the mathematician Lavrentiev was heading the Siberian branch of the Academy of Sciences. Karat chaired the American delegation of 24 mathematicians and a translator who attended the symposium, the first of its kind to be held in the Soviet Union. In both the preparations for the trip and his report after, it is clear that Krant saw his role and that of his colleagues as ambassadors of the United States. In selecting the delegation, he wrote, I consider the meeting in Novosibirsk 
<coughs> as a unique opportunity to work for the improvement of international relations. Particularly careful selection of the delegation is important, not only from the point of view of scientific merits, but just as much from the point of view that delegates should be suitable personalities. We refer to the mathematicians as ambassadors. The final list of delegates is shown here. This notion of the mathematician serving as a cultural ambassador was explicitly recognized. Perhaps less explicit, but nonetheless implied by the mere presence and content of these reports, was the role of these mathematicians as informal informants of sorts. This becomes evident in Crown's official report of the meeting to the National Academy of Sciences. It is unclear how widely this report was distributed. There are indeed many copies in the archive, which perhaps means it was widely distributed. Um, I'm still trying to track down exactly where, where it ended up. Um, he described the overwhelming hospitality of his Russian colleagues of all age groups in the academy town of Nova Spirce, <clears throat> quote, until recently practically out of, forms, uh, out of bounds for foreigners. Krant began his description of the delegation's two weeks in academy town by comparing it to the whole polytechnic in terms of combining scientific training with research. He praised its founders, Lavrentiev and Sobolev, among others, reiterating his observations of other parts of the Soviet Union from his prior trip three years ago. He commented on the interaction between applied and pure mathematics and the emphasis on the broad spectrum of mathematics. Koran also reported on some more technical matters, describing the computing center, which was staffed with about 400 people and shown to him and his colleagues, quote, very openly. He made comparisons to the US and observed that while the equipment was, quote, inferior to the modern machines in the USA, the center was still impressive for the practical and theoretical work being done in the art of electronic computing. He also reported on the Nuclear Physics Institute, but the, kept those remarks brief, noting that his colleague, Harold Brad, a leading theoretical plasma physicist, was writing a special report on it for the Atomic Energy Commission. In his list of general impressions, Krant noted, quote, the spirit of quiet self-assurance among Soviet mathematicians, which he felt had strengthened since his, since his last visit, commenting on the level of mathematics in the United States as being either equal to or superior to that of other nations. Krant also spoke to the political environment, commenting that, quote, the two weeks in Novus Gothiers provided daily opportunities for frank personal talks with scientists of various backgrounds. It was striking to realize that communist dogma plays very little, if any, role for most of these people, in particular not for the young. They are loyal to their country, but they are openly eager to learn about different ways of social and economic life. The desire to visit the U.S. not as mere sightseers, but rather as participators in American life and work is universal." End quote. Kroc presented a rather nuanced description, stating, quote, in spite of critical feeling towards party dogma and oppressive bureaucracy, scientific people are very often strongly motivated by a patriotic sense of mission. Quite a number of our older and younger fellow scientists in Russia work unbelievably hard in research, teaching, and writing. Krant concluded his report with a series of recommendations for the U.S. National Academy of Sciences regarding its Inter Academy Exchange Program. Stressing the importance of the Soviet educational system, he wrote, we must take this much more seriously then we took the Sputnik and specific spectacular achievements. This educational effort undoubtedly reflects the highest degree of statesmanship. He suggested the value for more exchange, exchange visits, concluding that altogether, while one should not and could not forget the depressing aspects of life in the USSR, I want to express emphatically the expectation that scientific cooperation can do very much indeed for the cause of peaceful coexistence." End quote. In these written observations and recommendations, Courant seems to be functioning in two ways. First, he is informing his American peers about the social, political, and intellectual environment within Soviet mathematics. Second, he is asserting himself as a cultural ambassador, suggesting that such exchanges can have important political resonance in exposing Soviet citizens to Western culture on a personal level. This was not unique to Courant or the American delegation, of course, there is a rich history of scholarly exchanges with diplomatic purposes. And this exchange among the mathematicians was part of, for example, the larger inter-academy exchange program. 
In a 1977 National Academy of Science review of the entire Inter-Academy Exchange Program, it was remarked that the original goals were to establish individual and institutional contacts with the Soviet scientific community, to learn about the strengths and goals in Soviet science and engineering, to contribute to improved U.S.-Soviet relations, and to achieve a normalization of scientific contacts between the two countries. This NAS report concluded that, quote, the purely scientific achievements have generally been of lesser significance for the U.S. than such aspects of the program as building the world scientific community, keeping abreast of Soviet science and its political and cultural effects, end quote. This conclusion is certainly supported by the activities of the Kron Institute mathematicians who returned to the Soviet Union many times over the following decades. Louis Neuermer, who is part of our audience today, attended the Novosibirsk Symposium, uh, described the experience, quote, there were about 120 Soviet mathematicians. There were about two dozen American mathematicians. And it was like being on board a ship for two weeks. So you make friends immediately. And I've kept friends, a number of friends, since then, end quote. He did, indeed, return to Russia a number of times later in his career. And back in the U.S., he and his colleagues, as you shared with me, would take turns playing with Soviet mathematician Gelfand in seminars, interrupting the speaker to make comments and ask difficult questions. Peter Latz had similar reflections, saying, quote, there was a very close relation between the Soviet mathematicians and the Americans. Cold War or no Cold War. Very close, very warm. Adding that during the Novosibir Symposium, vodka flowed like water. <laughs> Courant himself returned to the Soviet Union for his final trip in 1967, shortly after being elected as a foreign member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, a rare and particularly poignant honor in the historical context. He declined an invitation in 1970 to return due to his declining health. I'd like to conclude today less with a conclusion but more questions, asking how these exchanges of American and Soviet mathematicians can shed light on the cultural and social role of the mathematician in the Cold War United States. <coughs> Clearly, during this time, the political landscape was a difficult terrain. The Kron Institute was very much a part of, of the academic, industrial, military complex. Large parts of their work were sponsored by government and military agencies. Kron himself had Q-security clearance. But the mathematicians adamantly sought a more complex self-identity. Grant and a number of his colleagues were still vocal about the role mathematics and science could play in bridging the gap between the two superpowers. So I hope to continue that discussion uh, the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. So as we said, we can have uh, some quick factual questions specific to this paper before we go into the general discussion. Um, I have a very quick one to begin with. So on your last point, right? So it is it's striking actually. So these are these are people who are being paid for by defense industries of their country, right? Yeah. They're employed, or it's, it's what stimulates their research in, in many regards. And so, on the other hand, they're, they're talking about peace, right? And, and the so it's still hard for me to grasp how it is they can say both things at once, and on what level they can actually be promoting, think that they're promoting peace. I mean, what, how would you characterize their, their peace <coughs> mission? Um, on, on what level can they actually claim legitimately that they're promoting peace right, in the middle of the Cold War? Right, so that's... Um, Thank you, that's a fantastic question. It gets right to the heart of what I'm doing in this paper. So what interests me about this um, is the tremendous complexity on the individual level as well as the institutional level. Um, and I think the same questions that we have about how the mathematicians can at the same time be taking on these huge military grants, the Office of Naval Research, Atomic Energy Commission, they were operating a you know, supercomputer, which when the Soviet, their Soviet colleagues came to visit them, they were told by the Atomic Energy Commission not to share the, the technical guidebooks, not to show the inside of the actual computer. But at the same time, the Atomic Energy Commission, the State Department, for example, wanted to welcome these Soviet colleagues. So it's, it's a, there's a complexity, there's a, there's a contradiction, but at the same time, I think <coughs> at an individual level, it just shows how much these people were just part of the historical moment in which they work. Um, that's what it meant to be a mathematician in 1965. He worked for the Office of Naval Research. Um, but Karant, on a personal level, had close contacts with his colleagues in the Soviet Union. 
But also, he, the State Department was interested in what he had to say about them when he came back. Right. So, they debriefed you know, them, right? Yeah. And he briefed them, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I have no, no evidence that it was anything that the Soviet mathematicians at the time did not want to have shared. Um, what I have seen in the reports are things that he express, explicitly said were shown to him openly. Uh, he gave his own personal remarks. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. But yes, that's absolutely. So hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll, I'm sure this will come up again. <laughs> and, and also, it's not specific, by the way, to mathematicians or to scientists. I mean, I was trained in the United States at the PhD level, but paid for by some combination, directly or indirectly, the Department of Education, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, and the CIA, right? Oh, my SOR. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they don't say it in the names, particularly not the CIA, but it was a French organization. They paid for us too, right? Um, so it's not, and it doesn't mean I have to debrief or anything like that, but that's where my money came from. Oh, that's a fantastic example. <laughs> Do you want to identify yourself? Um, yeah, I'm Jakob Fagan. I'm from the Department of History at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have a question about the Cold War and how it comes into your paper, because it's clearly there. It's about the Cold War, but it pops in and out as incidents. So I'm wondering if the Cold War is really what's going on here, <coughs> or is there an older, more continual line in which Courant is a member of the continental scientific tradition, because you're saying he's meeting these people in the 20s, meeting these people in the 30s, he's meeting them in the 50s. So the, are these trips really a break, or are they a continuation of a longer conversation? Because again, he's talking about this Russian tradition, <coughs> these German, Russian mathematical scientific mm -hmm. traditions are connected to Germany, and in fact, there's this kind of reference to the continental tradition. So I'm wondering if is the continental context, the German context of Quran, that lets him become an ambassador, and somewhat in a way, actually, Henry Kissinger identifies himself as continental. That's not really part of the Cold War, but something above it, bringing it down to kind of real politique or older mathematical Absolute. exchange. Again, fantastic question. Um, and I'll keep my response brief because I know we're, we're moving forward. But um, I think Karat's experiences in Germany and his mm -hmm. continental training and his interaction with Russian mathematicians decades prior to the Cold War was absolutely instrumental in his ability to be, to have this network. Before the the National Academy of Science even had this inter-academy exchange program with the Soviet Union at the time, Krant had already been exchanging invitations um, with these with these other mathematicians. So I, I would never describe him as all of a sudden entering into this complex during the, the Cold War. I think it's it's a much more complicated, longer, longer story. One more question, anyone? Yes, please. Yeah. Would you identify your comments? Koran's wife had lots of relatives in Germany, and they, he went immediately after the war uh, to see them. So going to Russia was additional. Yes, thank you. So um, that's Kathleen Norwitz, who is one of the former directors of the Institute. Um, so thank you for being here and sharing your comment. Um, Yes, and that's what also <coughs> impresses me about this history is that Quran, um, you know, within the history of emigre mathematicians, you see some of the emigre mathematicians returning to Germany, and some that never wanted to return to Germany at all. So I mean, there's this entire spectrum. And Quran was, he, he didn't obviously move back to Germany, he stayed in New York, as you know, um, but he returned to Germany every single year, um, every summer, and was part of uh, the reconstruction effort. You mentioned that in 1963, a lot of the mathematical, being a mathematician, entailed doing a lot of work for the Defense Department and so on in America. Or specifically, at least at the Kron Institute. Yeah. yeah. What do we know about the, the corresponding uh, situation for the Soviet mathematicians? Mostly, I'm going to tell you all about it. Now, Dr. Ksenia Tadashenko, congratulations. Thank you. Recently arrived from Princeton, um, from New York, where she belongs. Um, <laughs> she will speak to us. Um, uh, it's, it's derived from your presentation, right? All right. It's, it's 
is relative to uh, our question. Tenure? Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming and for being here. I will try to speak slowly because sometimes I know uh, like people will not always hear what I'm trying to say. Um, well, it's, already, it's kind of easy for me to talk after Britain because she already introduced the main topic, right? We, you already saw this picture. And actually, I really want everyone to be able to see the images because I'll try to build some of my arguments using pictures. So in this talk, I'll try to ask, how did the American mathematicians find themselves in the middle of Siberia, right? What kind of place was this Siberian science city, Akadian Garadok? I'll question the notions of mathematical universality by interrogating the meaning of the location of a Soviet American symposium, which was the first major conference that took place in the just being science city. But to answer these questions, I'll have to tell you the story of Akadian Garadok's creation. So right next to Richard Kurt, in the first row of the picture, we have Mikhail painted from Jump Out. So this is Kurt, this is lovely. Oops, that was bad. Did I do that? <laughs> okay, so let's see how technology works. Okay, I'll try not to touch anymore. So I just this guy just next to Kurt. So this is 63, right? Five years before, we see Lavrentiev on the pine tree. How did that happen? So what grants an delegation of party and state officials of the city of Novosibirsk was visiting the forest nearby Novosibirsk where they thought that the city might be located. What happens is that it was a nice day, so a grant takes off his hat, takes off his coat, and climbs the pine tree to everybody's great surprise. Of course, this is a foundational myth, right? And he pronounces what's a wonderful place, and this is where the city is built. <laughs> but it's not only a myth, it's a myth of the making, because there was a professional photographer who took this <coughs> picture. And what our granted was doing, he was not only trying to see the place, he was trying to be seen by the party officials. What he was showing was his physical strength, he was 57, he could climb the tree, he can build the city, but also sort of his social status well above the party officials, because he was somebody very close to Khrushchev, he was part of his personal circle. And this is why I really wanted to open my talk with these two images, so to show you the official and non-official side of the story, and also to explain why, actually, I want to talk about the city, but I will tell you the story of the man who built it. Um, so what I'll try to do is sort of combine this biography and geography and you know, try to follow our range as he travels and uh, is integrated into what we just mentioned was a continental uh, networks of mathematics. Uh, so I'll talk about his childhood and we'll see why his childhood is important. Then we'll talk about the period he spent in Ukraine, how did he go to Siberia, and then I'll talk more about the special status of Akadim Garadok as a showcase and then to try to figure out what kind of relationship this regional city had with Moscow. So we will start with the start of the century. We are 1900, and this is when uh, Lavrentiev is born in Kazan. So for Russian specialists, Kazan is, of course, one of these major places of conferences of cultures, one of the first regional universities. For non-Russian specialists, you still may know of Nikolai Lobachevsky, and this is where he taught. So we think about the mathematical school. This is important because Lavrentiev's father is a mathematician. He graduates from the Kazan University in 1910 and obtains a fellowship to travel to Europe. He spent some time in Göttingen and in Paris, of course. This trip is particularly important not only for Lavrentiev's father, who does a metaphor story, but for Michel Lavrentiev, who is 10 years old at this point, because Lavrentiev as the family become very close to Lusians. And of course, this is a crucial name for, and again, we'll talk about it again and again. And so they spend a lot of time together, they bath together, they joke together, they solve mathematical rhythms together. And Michel Lavrentiev learns a little German, a little French over here, right? It's integrated with all these circles. After the revolution, the Lavrentiev and the Lusians are in contact again, and Lusin helps Lavrentius to move to Moscow. So Misha Lavrentiev, who's by now like a teenager and then like grown up man, becomes an active member of what is called Lusitania, which is like the circle of mathematicians, very well described in the work of uh, Lauren Graham and Lusana Shetkantor in any activity. So I want to describe it in too much detail because we'll be talking about it again. Uh, Adam will describe more. But what is important is that, so he graduates in 23, he graduates from Moscow University in mathematics. In 27, thanks to Luz, and he obtains a scholarship to go to Paris. Luz goes himself, a number of Russian mathematicians are in the same place. And Paris is important because 
there is a Hadamard seminar there, right? And so this is one of the sort of key meeting places of where all the encounters of the international mathematics happen at this point. And so this is where Lavrentiev, by then, you know, 27 year old, presents his work in the theory of partial differential equations. Well, he's a pure mathematician, so he contributes <coughs> to the theory, and he talks to Bologna next year at the International Congress of Mathematicians. He presents his work, and we really see sort of a maturation of the mathematician in the making. In the same time, many other things happen. So, for instance, he gets married, and he gets married not to anybody, <laughs> but to a very interesting person. Her name is Vera Demchikova. And not only is she is trilingual, because she's a daughter of an immigre woman biologist who like, left the revolutionary Russia and ended up teaching biology here at Columbia. Uh, so her daughter kind of follows her trajectory and also is trained biologist. Uh, so this is kind of an international connection to science story, but also like, she's an American citizen and she will keep her American citizenship well into the 30s. And when we know sort of history, we know that this is something not in fact an obvious way, especially when we see how the mathematics will be integrated into the very um, tissue of the building infrastructure of modernity in the Soviet Union, right? And this is also something very important during this period. By 29, while Rentsev is a major turn in his work and his career, he is no more a theoretician because he actually works at Tsaigi, which is the center of Hydra, Aero, Hydrodynamics Institute. But I mean, to say it quickly, it's, it's known as Tsaigi and it's the cradle of the Soviet aviation. Again, so this little plane is four engines, so the problem is in vibrations, and we're going to be working on how to solve the problem of vibrations. Why this is important? Of course, like, there is wonderful literature on the aviation industry culture and everything connected to this avian technology for the Soviet Union. We know that for Stalin personally, this sort of aviation came to represent the Soviet modernity, and this is what he was trying to do. And this is what sort of became very, very important for most of the Soviet citizens. Like, I don't need to tell the story because it's very well known in the literature. So we are, by here we are in the late 20s, early 30s, and in the same time, like, the other sort of context for the story, uh, the very moment when sort of, uh, when we have Lavrentz of working at Sagi on these wonderful planes, there are important events that happen within the medical community, and these are very unpleasant events. So Igor, who is the advisor of Luzin, so the patron of Luzitania, is arrested. But by the middle 30s, it's Luzin himself, who is uh, the main subject of very unfamous Luzin affair, and uh, as uh, World Grand demonstrates, so Lavrentz is among the people who sign letters of denunciation for his teacher. And so this is like a very complex story, but we need to follow him through all these complexities because we need to understand how he ends up in Ukraine. So by the late 30s, despite his numerous contributions in um, theory and applications of partial differential equations, Lavrentiev is not elected to the Soviet Academy of Sciences, which is a big role for him, but he is offered a position as a member of the Academy of Sciences in Ukraine, uh, Soviet Republic, which is a period, but still he's also for the directorship of the mathematical institute there, and we are just before the war. Lavrentiev moves to Ukraine and the war starts, there is evacuation. During the evacuation, his research is classified for sure, but uh, these images sort of are telling us enough, so he works on the theory of explosion, and he actually uh, comes up with the theory uh, of uh, shaped charge behavior, which is very, very important for Soviet weapons such as Katyusha, and after the war, he continues working on the military-related subjects, such as wet powder. He's very much into on-hand experiments. And not only that, he becomes the right-hand man of the president of the uh, Ukrainian Academy of Science, who is actually mortal ill, as you can see in this picture. And uh, I put this picture, for instance, uh, because the man next to Lavrentiev is nobody else is Nikita Khrushchev, because he was the first man in Ukraine at the same time. And so we see Lavrentiev not only climbing uh, administrative hierarchy of Soviet science, but also uh, developing an intimate, like, close working relationship with a man who will be very important in Soviet history, as it turns out. Uh, so this is sort of what happens in the forces. In the first post-war decade, he's very active. But just to summarize like three main activities, he is part of the nuclear research program, he is part of the digital computing development. He is part of the creation of the new educational facilities, which should be known as ISTEC, the famous um, Moscow Physical Technical Institute, to create new kind of experts uh, for the new Cold War research. 
Uh, this is how he summarizes his himself, his main activities, and his feeling of frustration, which led him to formulate the idea of the Siberian, the Siberian project. Uh, but what I really wanted to do here is to work with one particular document, which, which is an article which was published in Pravda, the main central Soviet newspaper, <coughs> in, uh, on February 14, uh, 1950. Six, which is published just before the 20th Party Congress. Of course, every historian of the Soviet Union knows this Congress because this was the Congress when the denunciation of Stalin crimes happened. But like nobody or very few people pay attention that what some of the parts of the resolution of the Congress was about Siberia and development of the territories. So what happens in this article published before Congress, and which is very humbly framed, this is just a response to suggestions, there is actually an agenda for how to reformulate the Soviet science, reorganize it, and bring it to the territories. And it ends up with like, this very formulaic expression, which doesn't do it as formulaic when we think about the names by which it is signed, and when we think about the context of still Krau's struggle in Kremlin, and that Krau Khrushchev was trying to um, sort of take over the industrial ministries, which are extremely powerful. Right? And so the names, just uh, to make sure that you can see them, so it's a Christianovich, who was a very close friend of Fabiantsev, somebody who involved in the building of Akadam Gorodok uh, since the time of when they worked at Sagi, Lavrentiev himself, a Lebedev, who is one of the pioneers of digital computing, and a protege of Lavrentiev, because it was Lavrentiev who helped Lebedev to build the institutions which allowed for the development of digital computing in the Soviet Union. But on the other hand, so we have like, this publication, right? So everybody can see it, right? Something uh, very visible. But on the other hand, behind this publication are the personal network. And of course, Khrushchev and Gavrin were in personal contact uh, by phone and in, in, in meetings. And for instance, uh, there is one particular citation I wanted to show you. Um, so we have Khrushchev, who's talking about and This is in the memoirs of Khrushchev. And uh, Lavrentiev shares his idea of actually building a new science city in Siberia, uh, to which Khrushchev response is, who among scientists will go there? This is Mother Siberia. It is yet a scare crown, and after the death of Stalin, millions of people served their term there. All right, so this is serious uh, critique of the project here. And still, this is a conversation which happened maybe in the summer of 56. On May, 19, May 18th, 1957, a decree of the Central Committee and the Council of Ministers ordered the creation of the Siberian branch of the Soviet Academy, the construction of the Center in Novosibirsk, and also a series of research institutes to the East. So Lavrentiev indeed won support of the government and sufficiently large number of scientists. And what he did to counter this old vision of Siberia is to present Siberia not as a land of exiles, like the Sharashki, but a romantic place of natural beauty and wildness. And what he presented is so it's like that there will be a conquest of this beauty, right? So it will be, well, to the government, he promised that he will make this wilderness profitable, but the site is to offer the cats instead of sticks. And so in the city itself was a carrot, right? So it, it was a model, model city of material privileges but also of a new relationship right, that he promised that he will build over there among the scientists. And so what already in the article, the promise that uh, the kind of uh, new knowledge will be created on the cracks between disciplines thanks to mathematical modeling, new computational methods. So it's very much, it's very much about mathematics. Right. But at the same time, for us to understand how this project could be actually realized, it is also important to think about the larger context of the growth of the number of scientists during this time, not only in Soviet Union, but in the West as well. And so this was a propitious moment for the new structures to emerge, and they were emerging all over places. So, but it took a very peculiar form in the Soviet case. So how do, can I summarize sort of the whole city for you, like in one or less than two minutes? So I thought that I'll just use like, several images so <coughs> I try to do it. And uh, m maybe sort of thinking about as a complex place is the best way to do it and thinking about contradictions. So on one hand, it, we know that it's a new place and very peculiar place, right? Because it's like one dot right there in the middle of the Soviet Union. But at the same time, it was a place which was built by everybody because, you know, people came from all over the world, <coughs> so that's one thing. 
It's also a new place, right? On the Hanwha, granted, we have like, this um, architectural scheme, right? It was a new city considered, actually, it was really a, a monument to the idea of how to, uh, the architecture of the Kishore period, because it was one of the first places where we viewed micro regions or what were uh, these uh, houses with multiple apartments or uh, single family apartments which are associated with Kishore, called Kishore. Okay. This is where it all happens, so it's like the festival site, all this. Uh, New developments, but at the same time, you know, on the right of the slide, right, you can see the peasant house, and this was where Lavrentiev lived. And this place, this house, was built before Petenka and this is where Lavrentiev moved in because he actually oversaw the construction. He was living on the site, and this is where, right, this new city environment of new structural changes, new discipline, you know, all the negotiations happened in this wooden house. The shop went in this and came with what had dinner with Kermeni at this wooden house. All the generals, because it was very much still like a military, um, there are a lot of military applications, the research was done, like, I think there were, all the negotiations happened in this wooden house. So it's like, how do you, sort of, it's impossible to disentangle all the new elements in this story. In the same time, of course, we talk about the city, we talk about the construction site, as you can see on the image down there, right? So we see the crane, it's the building and the road. But at the same time, it was actually an image, because as you can see, this is a professional image taken by a professional photograph, circulated in the publicity, the public relationship device, which was circulated all over the place again. So it's a city as a construction, but it's also an image, and it's very important to think about it as an image. And for instance, but what kind of image, right? This, and this is where I want you to sort of pay attention to the emblem of the scientific city. Of course, there are 14 research institutes, all current disciplines, but to represent this interdisciplinarity, we use mathematical symbol, by the way. Sigma, right, which is a sum of efforts and sum of disciplines. But the language to express this interdisciplinarity is mathematics. So there are many interesting interplays in the story, and so this is sort of what I can, the basic things I want you to remember about the Katangradov. So we need to think about this as a physical space, but we also need about, to think about it as a showcase. And this is why I would use this famous sort of word that it is a city that cannot be hidden. Because it wouldn't be constructed if it was a closed city. It's constructed as an open city, and this is its role uh, in the Soviet society. But it not only served this role of an open city as a showcase for the Soviet society, it actually also crossed the borders, these images, right? So it was the meeting place for all the international delegations stopped in the Katyn uh, later and before in the, the, the symposium. But what is particularly important about what happened during these moments of interaction? If it's a showcase, I think it's important to underline that it was a showcase where the showcasing didn't happen behind a thick window pane. But it was, as already written, showed us, it was very intense. It happened really person to person. And uh, what sort of, I hope these images also help us to see this so both again. So it's very close, right? It's person to person, but it's also served by a camera of a professional photographer one more time. And these images are circulated in press by the local newspaper, but the local newspaper will also feed into the national papers and international papers. So it's always sort of this media big project. So the symposium was part of this showcase. And yet, if you look more into the documents, right, it's interesting what's the substance of these descriptions, right? So on that hand, so we see the international greeting, right, in, in, you know, in 60 days, one year after the crisis. And the Soviet newspaper writes things welcome, right, in English to the Soviet citizens, you know. Um, in the body of the sort of publications following the symposium, we have the detail of the symposium, and so we have all these details, what did we do, how did we dance, how, how did we talk, how free it was, so there is like wonderful description. But we also have uh, Richard Courant, who talks to this journalist and shows that he's very eager to play the game, because again, as already written, you mentioned, <coughs> Like he does compare what he sees in Akadem Gradov, he's in such a wonderful place, it's an, indeed the model, and uh, it should be like part of the progress of the origin of the whole world. And he compares it to the Polytechnic and nothing else. But if you think about the Polytechnic, this is a very much a political project. So what we see, I think, in these sort of responses is not <coughs> only what Kuran uh, sees in Akadem Gradov, but what he wants to see what he wants to talk about and what kind of, uh, what is the ideal relationship between science and politics for this kind of generation. And I think this vision for Kurant is not that dissimilar from Lavrientis. And I think this is where sort of, we understand why the contact really worked and uh, how 
this positive atmosphere was building up. And so going from the I won't go into the details of the symposium for the sake of time. How we are on time, actually. Uh, okay. Um, so, but sort of, I want to go back to politics, right? To back to, uh, to the, the relationship between places. Uh, so, this international authority, which was constructed during the symposium, right, in '63, it was backed up very much by the uh, new relationship building up between the scientific experts and the power uh, under Khrushchev. And so what these documents show us is that in uh, uh, February 63, uh, Vavrientsev managed to negotiate a new status for scientific expertise in Soviet government. So he is named the head of the new council, scientific council, which has only <laughs> consultative uh, privileges at the government, but still uh, what is, I think is interesting here, that we have a creation of a governmental organ, including Lavrentiev as the head and a bunch of his uh, uh, friends, I would say, or so people who are very close to him, who are supposed to consult for sure independently of other governmentals about the uh, governmental policies and state uh, and science-related um, <coughs> issues. Of course, this council didn't last long, but I think that the very fact that it exists is very interesting, but it's even more interesting than the location itself, right? They have two rooms in Kremlin, they have governmental car, they have secretaries. So they're really part of this sort of world of power. And uh, why it is crucial, because in the historiography, the Academy of Dog experiment is very often told about as escape story. So the ideology is so hard in Moscow. So what scientists do, they want freedom, they go to Siberia and they hide there, and uh, they are able to make good science, they till the power catches them up and corrupts them, or corrupts them, so the really good, good place that they build. So basically what we see is actually the opposite story, is that the Lavrentiev managed to successfully build up this model community, and this success allowed him to get closer, not further away from Kremlin. And this is how I think we need to think about these things. And uh, what, where also the interesting part is, is coming in, also, the council, of course, is um, disabled just after the Khrushchev dismissal from power. But Akadem Garadok, as a city, is going to stay there. Lavrentiev is going to keep his status and his power over Siberian Soviet science up to the middle of the 70s. And the person who will succeed him is somebody he trains and somebody very close to him who will take over. That's on one hand, so we have a much sort of longer continuity across the political ruptures. But also, <coughs> If we see the different geography, and this is why I, sort of, I would like to sort of go to the conclusion of conclude the different international event. Just three years after we have this symposium, like me and Britain are talking about, a huge conference is taking place in Moscow. This is the famous International Congress of Mathematicians. Already in 62, at the same time as Lavrentiev negotiating they are, and arranging the symposium in the Kazan Garadok, he goes to Stockholm to the previous International Congress of Mathematicians and uh, manages to obtain uh, from Moscow and from the Soviet Union to host the next Congress, which is 66 Congress. And this is the biggest one. There are 4,000, it's twice bigger than all the previous ones, 4,000 mathematicians in attendance. Many of them are Soviets, unprecedented numbers. So but the demonstration of the power of the Soviet School of Mathematics is tremendous. The atmosphere is great. Uh, Miles is here as one of the mathematics like, schools who moved to Siberia as like, you know, they are working and even well when they are drinking. So we have this image of mathematics across the borders. And of course, you know, where this all happens in the building built to Stalin, you know, with the famous Stalin skyscraper. And of course, we, here we have an old friend of Orient who is then the president of the, con uh, of the society to tell us a story about what kind of knowledge are they producing, and he explains that the fact mathematics, you know, from the absolute true, because experiment climate control theory is only by discussion with others that we can discern and correct our errors. And I think this is a wonderful moment to sort of recapture this sort of the positive atmosphere and how we can imagine that mathematics is a kind of a social enterprise, it's an international type of knowledge which is you know, validated in discussion in Moscow, right? During Cold War. Um, so how do we do that, right? So we get to like Yanni's question, right? How is it possible? And I think uh, one of the sort of theoretical concepts that helped me to work through these questions is uh, Nikolai Kremensov's concept of uh, double royalties. And when he thinks about sort of genetics and uh, what happened to the genetics in the 30s, 
how do we accommodate these national allegiances and national structures in the same time as the international authority, which is necessary for the normal function of the disciplines, for knowledge to be produced. And I think that we need to accommodate the two of them. And I think what happens in Moscow in 66, it's like the moment when two of them are actually in harmony and not in tension. And this situation is more or less like this during the 60s and the 70s, where are many more uh, bilateral agreements, and I have worked in the Soviet French bilateral agreements, and the cooperation in numerical methods. I know like, a lot about what happened in computer science between Americans and Soviets. Whereas it's kind of routinized, it's not always seen, <coughs> but it's localized and up through the 70s. But then, and sort of this discourse of kind of universal knowledge helps them to understand what they're actually doing, right? But then by the late 70s, there is a different concept of universality with the uh, human rights movement. And this is where so we have many, many conflicts, which I maybe we can also talk about, because this uh, vision helps us to explain things, but not all of it, uh, not throughout the Cold War. Uh, just to conclude, so where does this story sort of following people and places uh, brings us? So I actually think that it kind of helps us to think more about things that we usually think separately about and think more about the relationship between these opposite uh, things, such as like what is Stalinist and post-Stalinist science, so we can see ruptures, but we can also see continuities. We can sort of follow uh, again sort of John Krieger lead and think about uh, big science and big politics, and this is where, of course, Europe will come in, right? And so we'll have a very interesting Unlike in the dominating historiography, where it's very much, if you talk about Cold War science, it will be that Americans, and maybe against the Soviets, right, is separate entities, we can think about them in relations and then Europe will be very prominent and scientists at them. So it's uh, things that the stories which are very often told separately, but we can tell them together. And of course, we can think more about the circulation of knowledge, what does it mean to be local and to be universal, and how does it travel across the borders, but also sometimes from one department to another. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, any quick uh, questions for for the speaker? Uh, identify yourselves, please, when you do, when you do ask a question. Yes. Uh, Barbara Walker, University of Nevada, Reno. I'm at the Institute uh, for Advanced Study right now. Um, and I'm working on a, a project I call a war of experts, so looking at different ways in which American and Soviet experts are coming together throughout this early Cold War period. I'm especially interested, I'm, I'm writing a section right now on the Besom, the building of the Besom by Sergei Lebedev, um, with the support of Lavrentiev in, in Ukraine. Uh, and I'm comparing that with the other first stored program computer um, building in the US, which is at the Institute. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about his um, engagement with that project in Ukraine. So I know he was really important. So if I understand correctly, it's against the place that matters. So I haven't been there person, but I really want to go. So we have <laughs> Kiev, but on the outskirts of Kiev. Yeah, right, 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 exactly, in a monastery. monastery. Yeah. So what Vavrentiv is doing there at this time, he's doing explosions. He's doing like this show spectacle. So the Khrushchev and like, all these parties should come up. And Vavrentiv will show how they can make explosions, but go in a certain direction. And this is very useful for building on socialists. In the same time, we have, a, we have a monastery, right, which is empty. And uh, uh, Lebedev, of course, already wants to work on digital computing during the war, but he has no possibility to do so. And Vavrentsev is very much interested in calculation, because he's a mathematician, and because he's been working on this old calculating intensive uh, kind of work during the war again. So he understands that he has a means to help Lebedev. So it's a very much an administrative kind of help. But then things, I think in Ukraine, things are relatively nice. But things are getting really bizarre when Lavrentiev moves to Moscow and right. he becomes the head of the team with the tears. Exactly, yeah, and, um, right, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it's, it's very, the, the title is actually very important because it's which is little technique. So it's not about digital technology. And in fact, the institute was created for analog technology. And the story of analog computing for the Soviet Union is almost non-existent. And it was the dominant technology because it was much cheaper, much reliable, right? And so it, it happens in St. Petersburg. Again, nobody works in St. Petersburg, right? So we don't know anything. But anyway, so those people in <laughs> Moscow, well, Avrentiv just gets rid of him. In the, and he's very proud of himself because how he does it, he says, well, they make fake plans for <laughs> scientific research. Everybody was doing it. So he's basically, uh, he's a killer, right? And people hate him. 
for that. But at the same time, he's very close to the government, so this new institute that he becomes head of. Well, he brings Lebedev yeah, there, right? Yeah, he brings yeah. Lebedev, and this is where Lebedev So it's a it's major like, good bet yes. that he made, because, because yes, Lebedev so knew what he was so doing. It's a very, very kind of like nice and dark story. So, I mean, uh, yeah, we can talk much more about it, but I don't know if it's going to be interesting to everyone. Right, right. Speaking of the question. I'd like to share something with everyone that would shed light on that gentleman in blue sweaters question and what the note that I gave this young lady. I attended an AABSO conference at Club University in Brussels at the close when they opened the Berlin Wall. And there were scientists from all over Soviets meeting the, the US. The head professor at, stood at the podium and opened up the meeting advising that they communicated with each other through two world wars and they built a Sinclair home computer. Mr. Pasmino here can explain it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, so that answers your query. The relationship goes way back in the Soviet, the German, the French, and the American <coughs> scientists and, and their sharing of technology, exactly for what you said, the correction of errors, because they were studying solar energy. Mm -hmm. uh, did you want to say something about home computers? Uh, Sinclair uh, home computers? John, you want yeah, to elaborate? Well, actually, um, well, um, among the earlier home computers, which, which basically is a Western uh, uh, phenomenon, that a machine, a program a computer, you could know, walk in the radio shop, literally, and buy. Um, of course, in the Soviet Union, didn't have that. We didn't have a demand or consumer or industry. But the the, um, what the Eastern Bloc, behind the Iron Curtain, would import and smuggle in um, samples of computers from from the West. You know, with the, a couple of like that, the old Commodores. Now, the Sinclair was actually a British machine, uh, not much bigger than that pad here, <coughs> flat. So if you sit in the cold or put in the luggage. And it was built by the um, Sinclair Research Company, which was a mathematical think tank more than anything else. <clears throat> so that machine was a single board with discrete elements and so on, which could be duplicated by a competent electronics lab from anywhere in the world. Uh, and the little CMOS that had the, um, the operating system on basically could be flash duplicated. And so that machine had many Soviet indigenous versions. Uh, of course, they were used within it, and they were also like underground. You couldn't walk into a uh, um, uh, toy store in, in Moscow and buy one. But you know, like your friend had a connection, had a connection, had a connection, <coughs> and they bought one. They didn't have it was in a wooden shoe box uh, or whatever, but you know, it actually worked. And the kids in school would play with it. No, not in school. Uh, at home, uh, play with it, and you could get the magazines, because in the old days, you didn't have purchase programs. You, you, you got a magazine on computers, and there was a, uh, a listing, you know, the line of code and basic, uh, which you would key in, and there were no disk drives. Um, you saved everything on cassette tapes, because there you no know, cassette tapes were around in the Soviet Union, and there was an audio jack, you played it, play it on that. And so that um, was, the, so, and then there was an exchange because they could communicate you know, by a chain of contacts to uh, Sinclair fans in the uh, UK and the, the, the British Commonwealth, was, so, and then the, <coughs> the US and Canada, where it was a very, very popular uh, computer. It's the one I grew up on, actually. In fact, I bought, I bought a kit form, then it sold all, all, all assembled. Uh, so they knew. I mean, the, the intelligence of basically uh, school children, the adults, like today, they don't know computers. Uh, so they were, after they had little clubs, there were you no know, unofficial clubs because you couldn't do it in school. It was not part of the uh, rhetoric, the, the, the curriculum and all that. Uh, so they could meet their friends' houses and so on. Uh, and some of them actually made very good code. Uh, Tetris came out of the Soviet Union. Oh, yes. So you, you, <laughs> that was going to kill us, you know. Uh, and it was written for the Sinclair, and then quoted to others. Uh, the other was that 
Um, they also worked out mathematics in, you know, applied mathematics. They wrote programs for that little turkey machine, which was actually a mathematically a very, very good machine for engineering applications, you know, uh, strength materials, design beams, uh, concrete structures. And they also did it for uh, actual dynamics, including uh, orbits, uh, including non gravitational effects on comets. Uh, and, that, and that was, and so this, and the change was um, uh, there, even if there was a delay, you had to use old telegrams, uh, uh, letter writing, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we should, um, is that a quick one? I, I, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so I don't know much about computer oriented, and that's why I don't really understand uh, how you're applying the concept of double loyalty to his story. I mean, I understand that being in Novosibirsk uh, meant for him actually being closer to the government structures and to the political leaders, but what's the other side of the loyalty? Well, he is actually, or maybe I don't articulate it very well, so, well, the Congress that happened in Moscow, it happened thanks to his work, because he was very well integrated into the international networks from the 20s and 30s. Okay. It was the same people. So that's kind of a part of his integration. The fact of him being very close to the government, it worked parallel and in harmony with him being part of the international community. Yeah. And so he basically acted as a host. This is how he's described in the memoirs of the people who went there. And they said, well, we can suppose that he's the most important one because he's the host, but also because he seems to have like, to take care of the place. And so, and the Congress in Moscow, it wasn't like the continuation of the showcase. Uh, no, this is something regular. Right? It's part of how mathematics functions in uh, international disciplines. They had these international congresses every four years, right? Um, and this is where so people meet together and share ideas and have relationships. So it's like what we're trying to have right now, but we do it on a kind of much upscale basis. So let's see. Course, an Wonderful. Um, we'll continue this, of course. Um, Adam Leeds. Hi, guys. Um, can we have my I don't have any pictures to show you. I need to sit in the dark. <laughs> okay, so uh, my paper is called um, Towards Computopia Mathematicians, Cold War Science, and the Rebirth of Economic Cybernetics. Uh, this is part of a larger project about how mathematical economics became possible in the Soviet Union. And I trace mathematical economics to the present from about the 1950s. Um, but important to this story um, is the mar larger interdisciplinary configuration called cybernetics, which is what I'm going to spend two thirds of my time on. Um, so here's how I start. So in the summer of 1960, two large conferences took place in Moscow, so three years before the one in Academic Order of um, from the 27th of June to the 2nd of July, Moscow hosted the first international congress of the newly founded International Federation for Automatic Control. It was the first international conference on such a scale organized in the USSR and had more than 1,200 attendees from 30 countries, including, I think, over 100 from the US. Um, the event itself was a spectacle, and many attended not because they had any interest in control engineering, but just to attend. Um, and the star of the production, though not himself on the program, was Norbert Wiener. Uh, his lecture on the 28th of June at the big auditorium of the Polytechnic Museum was standing room only, and it had to be repeated on July 1st for all those who were turned away. He was interviewed by all of the leading Soviet publications, from questions of philosophy to the literary review to nature, um, not his novel by literary review, um, his forgotten novel. Uh, Wiener himself, as well as his American colleagues, were astounded at this reception. Cybernetics, it seemed to them, was not nearly so popular in the United States among en mathematicians and, and engineers, let alone among the general public. And his reception ought to be doubly surprising given that his book, Cybernetics, had only been translated two years before, in 1958, which was the same year of publication as the first Soviet book on cybernetics, uh, Politaev's Signal. How could the Moscow intelligentsia already be in the grip of such a cybernetic euphoria? And the second conference, taking place in April of that summer, had no international participation, but for those taking part, it was no less monumental. It was the first large conference on, as it was then cautiously called, the application of mathematical methods in economics and planning. Just as in 1954, <coughs> the, just a couple years before where, where we started, the short philosophical dictionary still labeled cybernetics a bourgeois pseudoscience, 
1951, Stalin had, had, had uh, criticized the mere suggestion by one scholar that economists ought to discuss the rational organization of production as substituting Bogdanovism for Marxism. <laughs> Yet in 1957, the statistician Vasily Nemchinov was able to found the first organization tasked with exactly that, the Laboratory for Economico-Mathematical Methods, which became in 1963 the Central Economic Mathematical Institute, the center of Soviet reform economics. So how did these things happen? How could cybernetics go from unknown to uh, hysterical almost into this brief span? And how could mathematical economics go from forbidden to growing extremely quickly in a very small number of years? So scholarly attention to the history of mathematical economics in the Soviet Union has implicitly assumed that there was such a thing, that its boundaries were known. Its content was delimited and understood by identifying the mathematical apparatus and classes of models shared with Western neoclassical economics, and the cybernetic language that surrounded the models was just dismissed as modus traffics. But what is immediately striking when reading the list of speakers at this first major conference on mathematical economics, a conference celebrating its newfound legitimacy, was that nearly half of them were not economists at all, but rather mathematicians and computer engineers with no reputation for research or even interest in economics. Why were they there? What I will attempt to show is threefold. First, that the rebirth of mathematical economics in the Soviet Union was inseparable from the cybernetic project. Second, the central to both were one very coherent network of mathematicians which shared, had a shared culture of informal academic exchange. And third, that the ability of these mathematicians to push cybernetics as a means for building interdisciplinary alliances to reorganize post-war Soviet science stemmed from their engagement in military projects requiring new computational capacities. So on the one hand, inflected through the mathematicians, this story is part of a larger story about the growth of the post-war Soviet military scientific complex, and thus of the scientific technical intelligentsia in its late Soviet guise. And through the economists, on the other hand, it is part of the story of the internal evolution of Soviet economic thought that eventually issued forth in the first Yeltsin government, and thus the eventual dismantling of the Soviet Union. As should be obvious to this audience, um, my account will owe a lot to Slava Garovich's work as well as that of Lauren Graham. But what I hope I have are some interesting differences of emphasis um, as well as a different aim, which is to open up Soviet economics as a domain much in need of historiographical rethinking. Um, okay, so part one, mathematicians. So the core of the network of mathematicians was the famous Moscow Mathematical School, and the core of that was the generation of students trained by Nikolai Luzin. Uh, Luzin made breakthroughs in, in analysis, descriptive set theory, theory of functions, trigonometric series, integration, um, and this portfolio is important for his future students' work. Um, graduating from Moscow State University, he spent several years studying abroad in Göttingen and Paris before returning to teach in 1914. He maintained close contact with many of the major mathematicians of the day, including Hilbert, Lebeg, Baer, Borel. Um, in 1915, he defended it. Uh, okay. Over the next decade, he gathered a coterie of brilliant and loyal students and they called their society the mathematician's promised land, Lusitania, um, and they were far from cut off from the world community. They traveled abroad, published abroad, mostly in French, um, and were in communication with foreign mathematicians well into the 1930s. Uh, Komogorov and Wiener were intensely aware of each other's work in probability, for instance, um, and Kontorovich had met von Neumann at the 1935 Moscow Topological Conference. Uh, Luzin's style was to challenge his students relentlessly in an informal atmosphere, to give them problems much, so much so hard, too hard for them that they didn't know they shouldn't be able to prove them. Um, to liberally assign new directions of research that his own work opened up to others, and to work out his own ideas in front of his students. And this style of informal mathematical education far beyond the classroom, they would talk all night, they would work at his dacha, um, was to repro be reproduced across the decades and be both the interactional infrastructure and a conveyor of values. But all was not well in the mathematician's promised land. In the spring of 1928, a conspiracy of engineers was alleged to be discovered in the small mining town of Shakti, the beginning of a campaign in the course of which were arrested between two and 7,000 of the only 10,000 engineers with higher education in the Soviet Union, which culminated in the Industrial Party trial of 1931. Kendall Bales has uh, analyzed this as the climactic moment in which Stalin subdued the threat of a technocratic interpretation of the nature of socialism. The campaign extended into science and education, and activists at universities and institutes exposed wreckers amongst the professoriate and formed initiative groups to ideologically reform organizations. In 1930, this campaign hit mathematics. An initiative group of self-styled Marxist mathematicians, many of them losing his own students, joined a campaign led by party zealot 
and read Professor Ernst Coleman, who is universally described as a failed mathematician, um, that ended in the arrest and imprisonment of Dmitry Yegorov, Luzin's own teacher and the leader, leader of Moscow mathematics. Luzin resigned in protest and moved to the Central Aero Hydro Hydrodynamical Institute, SAGI, under the mathematician uh, Chapligin. Uh, SAGI, of course. Um, as a reward for his role, uh, Luzin's student, P.S. Alexandrov, the topologist, was given the chair of the Moscow Mathematical Society. Um, and in 1931, Coleman published a collection of articles called Towards the Fight for a Materialist Dialectic in Mathematics, which was nearly evenly split between attacks on Luzin's bourgeois deviations and attacks on the mathematical economists in Gosplan, Narcom Finn, and the Central Statistical Administration. Nearly all of those leading economists subsequently perished, essentially ending the flowering of economic thought from the 1920s. The Luzin was luckier. He kept his head low, though not low enough, because in 1936, for reasons unclear, but possibly related to Academy of Sciences elections, Alexandrov and Coleman launched another attack on Luzin, this time for a different set of reasons, which quickly progressed to a trial in which many of his own students testified against him. The mathematicians, however, maneuvered to keep Coleman and the Communist Party on the sidelines and control the proceedings themselves. This is probably responsible for keeping the political police away and let, thus Luzin from death. 1936 was not a good year to be on trial. Um, Luzin was subsequently unable to find work until 1939, at which point he was hired at the recently founded Institute for Automation and Remote Control, which later became the Soviet National Member Organization of the International Federation of Autom Automation and Control and the convener of the 1960 conference with which I began. This institution, soon renamed the completely dystopian Institute of Problems of Control, um, was an as yet unstudied hub of cybernetics, the closest thing yet to an official institute thereof. The most important result of these two episodes was that the young mathematicians, so this is conclusion one of this first part, these mathematicians, by first siding with the party and establishing their Bolshevik bona fides in 1930, managed to acquire institutional power, and then second, sidelining Coleman and the party during the Luzin trial, managed to dance a, a perfect Stalinist two-step. They had it all, institutional power, political trust, and a degree of scientific autonomy. Secondly, and in broader focus, it's also important that the culture of Moscow mathematics, the culture of the Russian intelligentsia, for many of these mathematicians came from intertwined scientific dynasties that went deep back into the previous century, was not thus extinguished and did not have to be reinvented during the thaw in the 60s. Vladislav Zubok argued that the literary and artistic intelligentsia had to reinvent what it meant to be the intelligentsia, but the math math mathematicians were never purged. Uh, a third, less dramatic result was that the peregrinations of Luzin in exile traced a path that his disloyal students would quickly follow. These students of Lucent's, and as time went on, their own students, so part two on um, Lucent's students uh, and the war, found themselves pulled out of pure mathematics. Uh, Lavrentiev, crucially, worked alongside Lucent at Sagi from 1929 to 1935. He attracted Mstislav Keldish, the future president of the academy, whose sister was also a Lucent protege. Uh, and they, they formed a, a theoretical wing of the of Sagi um, in which was also included uh, uh, Kristianovich, um, who was also involved in founding Akademi Borodov. Um, Keldish worked there 31 to 46, studying wing flutter while pursuing his doctoral studies at the Mathematics Institute. In the late 1930s, Kolmogorov pursued the theory of turbulence at the, at the Institute of Theoretical Geophysics. Uh, Lyapunov tried his hand at a vast variety of sciences. Uh, Pyotr Novikov worked at the Chemical Technical Institute from 29 to 34. Um, and here I have to bring into the picture two other mathematicians, which are crucial to my story, but so far left out on account of my Moscow centricity. Uh, Sobolev, who we've heard about a lot about, and uh, Leonid Kantorovich, who we haven't. While Leningrad and Moscow had different portfolios of mathematical specialties, these two were much closer in their interest to Lusitania. Their letters show that Luzin had tremendous respect for Kantorovich and was in regular contact with him. Famously, Kantorovich invented a linear programming in 1938 as the consultant to a plywood trust trying to maximize its output. In the system of the planned economy, and in light of the Leninist dictum that socialism is the organization of the country as though a single factory, Kantorovich easily made the metaphorical leap to apply linear programming at any scale, including the planning of the national economy. He is in many ways the key to this story, because he, above all, married pure mathematical ability, a zealous belief in the importance of computation that predated those that of other mathematicians, and a longstanding thematic focus on economics. When the war began, nearly all of these mathematicians were drawn into the effort. 
Not very much is known about their wartime research, but enough that three important conclusions can be drawn. First, this research was much more computationally intensive than their pre-war research, and brought them into contact with the circles of engineers working on the state of the art in computing technology, like circular media. Second, it brought them into contact with the military, which was crucial for nurturing cybernetics when it was still forbidden. Third, the delay between when cybernetics coalesced in the United States and when it did so in the Soviet Union, a delay during which computational technology made a qualitative leap, caused Soviet cybernetics to be structured much more deeply around the real and metaphorical possibilities of the computer. During the war, Kel Keldish continued to work in aeronautics at Sagi. Mavrentiev studied the physics of explosions, uh, Lyapunov worked on anti-aircraft utility, while Komogorov worked on bombardment and bombing patterns. And this began the latter two's important involvement with the Zhirdinsky Artillery Academy, which continued after the war. Kantorovich taught at the Military Engineering Technical Institute in Leningrad, where he taught a course on probability and wrote still secret memoranda on the survivability of various armaments, the laying of minefields, and the optimal cutting of steel for tanks. During this time, he also wrote the first draft of his now famous book, The Economic Calculation of the Best Use of Resources, in which he drew out the implications of his famous 1939 article, Introducing Linear Programming. With Sobolev's support, he sent the book to the leadership only to be rebuffed and labeled an anti-Marxist, and he wasn't able to secure its publication until 1959. Immediately after the war, key members of this network became involved in the computational tasks of rocketry and nuclear weapons development, and here they encountered the first Soviet electronic digital computers. Sobolev worked under Kurchatov at the Institute of Atomic Energy. Keldish organized the computational effort for the bomb at the newly founded Department of Applied Mathematics at the Institute of Mathematics. And when the bomb was finished, later became the chief theoretician to rocket designers, chief engineer for space travel. Kantorovich led the Leningrad affiliate of the Mathematics Institute working on calculations of uranium's critical mass. And Kronrod, Luzin's last student, ran the computational center at ITAP under Landau. He also used his excess computational time to run what may have been the first experiments in model-based price setting uh, with Vadim Belkin. Lusternik and Lavrentiev took up positions as department director and director respectively of the Institute of Precision Instruments and Computation, one of the early, early, uh, 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 yeah, let me get it. <laughs> At the same time, after the war and into the early 50s, all of the above named people contributed to the formation of chairs and departments of computer science or computational mathematics in the universities and institutes in which they taught, including the military academies. So while everyone focuses on their work at Moscow State University, they all taught at multiple places at once, including military academies. Um, the theorist of radio physics and dynamical systems, Andronov, was seeking a copy of Wiener's cybernetics, this is part three, cybernetics underground, um, as early as 1949, but it only truly entered the mathematician's milieu a couple years later. In 1951, Kitov, Anatoly Kitov, a newly graduated ballistics researcher at the Artillery Academy of the Ministry of Defense found a copy of cybernetics in English in the Spetskran of Special Construction Bureau 245, which was tasked with the design of computers for the military. He shared it with Lyapunov, who was teaching higher mathematics at the Artillery Academy from his demobilization in 45. This cohort of young colonels studying with Lyapunov at the Academy were subsequently to spread cybernetics throughout the first military, military computing centers in the 1950s. And if you look at who this cohort of Lyapunov students were, they basically led all of the very first computing centers in the military. So that's uh, Kitov, um, uh, Politeyev, who wrote Signal and also started the famous physics, uh, physicist versus lyricist debate, um, uh, Buslenko, uh, Bogozhev, uh, Krenitsky, uh, Kislik, uh, a whole bunch of military computational experts. All were studying under Lyapunov at the Artillery Academy. And so this is all while cybernetics was completely unknown in the civilian world. So Kitov wrote a report on cybernetics that he began to give at various seminars around Moscow, and it was eventually published with Lyapunov and Sobolev's revisions and signatures in 1955. Surprisingly, and perhaps ironically, this article was followed by a defense of cybernetics by the very same Coleman that had in 1930 so viciously pursued Luzin, Yegorov, and the economic planners. With Lyapunov's enthusiastic proselytizing, cybernetics spread throughout the infrastructure of the mathematics networks, the seminars. Lyapunov's seminar at the Artillery Academy was echoed by one at his home, and this quickly became what has become known as the Big Seminar, which met 121 times in Moscow between 1954 and 64. And here again, the military connection was crucial. One of the participants remembered that at the first meeting, 
all the known informers in the audience stiffened upon the entrance of all the cybernetic colonels from the artillery academy in uniform. Um, at the seminar, all of the various disciplines that were to receive cybernetic reframing met and mingled. From 1951 to 61, the ran an additional seminar on programming, game theory, and mathematical biology. Krushinsky ran one on biological cybernetics. Yevlensky, Yevlonsky on mathematical cybernetics and computer programming. Gelfond on biology and mathematics, both also at NYU, MG, uh, MGU. And the later spawned three others on game theory and biology, higher nervous activity, and psychology. Shurabura ran one on programming. Iserman uh, and Braverman ran one on automation and image recognition. So this is, these are the interdisciplinary sort of seminars that are the infrastructure of Moscow mathematics, right? They're not classrooms. They are meeting late at night often at people's homes. They're, they're officially known to exist, right? You know, the <coughs> party knew they were there, um, but they're not part of the official uh, educational infrastructure. Um, and these are only the interdisciplinary ones. These are not the ones that are located at one institute that were primarily attended by people from that institute. There were many, 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 many more of those. Um, through this seminar system, the genres of interaction and the forms of pedagogy that extended back to Yegor and Luzin, the forms of pre-Soviet intelligentnost that were maintained by them in unbroken continuity, became thoroughly entwined with cybernetics. And with the massive production of mathematicians and physicists first trained in this world and then moving into more applied fields, including economics, so the cybernetic intelligentnost came to permeate the post-war military scientific complex. And this expansion was aided and guided by the ascendancy of key members of this community to leadership of the academy on the wings of their autonomous successes. Teldish becoming president of the academy in 61, and Lavrentia leading the new Siberian division from 57. So the support of the mathematician cybernetician, cyberneticians mediated by Kantorovich crucially enabled mathematical economics to come out of its own underground. So this is part four, last part. While it's under the scope of this paper to go into this in any detail later, um, in, go into any detail, there was a network of people applying mathematical model methods to the economy, though most of its members could not be called economists. Its two primary constituents were, on the one hand, agricultural statisticians that had passed through the Timuryazov Agricultural Academy in the Central Statistical Administration, and on the other hand, engineers, especially hydroelectric and transportation engineers, many of whom were graduates of the Moscow Higher Technical School. The statistician Vasily Nimchino functioned as the organizer of this network, and through Kantorovich became aware of cybernetics, and in turn himself became known to the rest of the cybernetic network. So there's a, a merger of two underground networks happening here. Right? So you have these engineers and statisticians on the one hand, and you have the mathematicians slash computer scientists on the other, and they're gonna inter interface and interact through the medium of cybernetics. So in the 1950s, Nemchinov was working in the Council for the Study of Productive Forces, SOAPS, after being fired from the Agricultural Academy for his open opposition to Lysenko's biology. In 1957, with the support of, support of Lavrentiev, he was able to organize the first laboratory for economical mathematical methods. While located in Moscow, it was formally subordinated to Lavrentiev's Siberian division of the academy. That was the only way to make it work. Moscow. The, the official, the, the major branch of the academy was too hostile to it still. The 1960 conference with which I began was to be the public announcement of the rehabilitation of mathematical economics. And the force of this rehabilitation, signaled by the participation of nearly every cybernetician I have mentioned who had recently succeeded in building an atomic bomb for Stalin, could not have been lost on the members of the Orthodox Economics Establishment in attendance. In 1963, the laboratory was transformed into the Central Economic Mathematical Institute, and it absorbed a group on the effectiveness of capital investment from the Institute of Economics. So basically, it's gathering up the entire um, economics underground that had persisted for the previous two decades. So it gathers up the um, group on the effectiveness of capital investment from the Institute of Economics, the Department of Transportation Cybernetics, as they were already calling it, from the Institute of Complex Transportation Problems, then Shinov's former laboratory at SOAPS, the Department of Mathematical Economics of the Computer Center of the Academy of Sciences. Um, and Nemchina, by this time, already headed the economic section of the Council of Cybernetics. <coughs> Very quickly, his institute record, recruited large numbers of Mehnat trained mathematicians, especially Jews or those with political black marks. One person called this Nemchina's Ark, um, saving everybody from the flood. They brought with them not only a far higher level of mathematical sophistication than the engineers and statisticians that founded the institute, but also the culture of Moscow mathematics and a vision of their field as merely one of the applications of the cybernetic apparatus. 
So one of these people said once that um, I went into mathematics because I was interested, I went into economics because I was interested in artificial intelligence, but I thought the brain was too complex a system, whereas the economy was a much simpler one. <laughs> Great. It's amazing, the things they say, yeah. Okay, so economics, of course, was not far into the first phase of cybernetics, but it wasn't prominent, partly because it was felt to be politically dangerous. For Quito, for instance, it was always one of the main topics. <coughs> his first publications dreamed of a nationwide computer network to assist in planning, a project he never abandoned right up to the end of the Soviet Union when he was still writing letters to Gorbachev. In 1959, the artillery colonels once again proposed a dual-use nationwide military and economic planning network, the audacity of which led to Quito's <coughs> expulsion from the academy and the party in 1961. And similar projects were promoted by academic, academician Glushkov of the Ukrainian Academy. But this early cybernetic vision of planning was crucially different from that which grew under the guidance of Kantorovich, Nemchinov, and Lobozhilov, the, the founders of, of uh, economics, mathematical economics in the Soviet Union. And to understand the difference, it's important to begin with the fact that the disciplinary and methodological boundaries between economics, management theory, statistics, and accounting that we take for granted in the West simply didn't apply in the Soviet Union, which follows quite naturally from the structure of directive planning. The tax treated, tasks treated under separate disciplines in the US are inseparable parts of the planning process. In Kitov and Glushkov's versions, the problem of cybernetic planning reduced to creating a sufficiently pervasive, reticulated, and high bandwidth information channels with sufficient computational capacity that the economy could essentially be a well-controlled dynamical system. But for the economists, things looked a little co more complex. So for these guys, there's no, not, there's no economics in the planning of the economy, right? You just need to have information feedback loops going sufficiently in depth. Um, there's no vision of what an economic, an economic problem is. Right? But during the 1940s and 1950s, the, um, the, <coughs> the economists, or the, the pseudo-economists, had encountered three interlinked problems. First, that of judging between alternative capital investments. Second, there's just hydroelectric dams, right? Which dam should we build? Um, which, which railroad is worth investing in? Second, the problem of price setting, such as to most efficiently utilize scarce resources. And third, the disjuncture between the national plan and the incentives of plant managers. With Kantorovich's discovery of linear programming, these problems received an encompassing mathematical framework. And what Semi began to propose, and continued to propose right up until Gorbachev began to implement some of its recommendations, was that with the help of computers and linear programming, the management of the economy could actually be decentralized. In the first and simplest, simplest versions, it gets much more complex, a vast linear programming problem fed numbers from a newly automated computerized statistical apparatus would be crunched with the help of the enormous computer network. And the result would be a set of prices and other so-called normatives. And once these were given to the enterprises, their own self-interested behavior, their improvisational optimization with respect to these indicators would cause the computed plan to be brought to fruition. You didn't have to tell people what to do, you told them to make money, but you just had to give them prices first. <laughs> This deeply cybernetic conception, borrowing as much from a vision of total control as it did from one of self-organizing systems, one that imagined its algorithms in a deep ontological indifference to be as much the operations of the computer as the behavior of economic agents, was to guide Soviet reform economics up through Paris Troika. And I'm done. So I think we should plunge directly into it. It's not that I don't have wise things to say as commentator, but I think you all have wiser things to say than I do. So why don't we go directly? Yes. So I have two questions. One is that I identify as well. Oh, Jakob Fagan, Department of History, University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I have two questions. One that goes to Adam, since we more or less work on the same project directly, and then one that probably brings together Adam and Xenia. My first question is about bringing the state back into this story, because some of this stuff is almost becomes legislation around 1968 in the Kasigan reforms. And the question is, I understand kind of what the state can give the economists, aka resources. However, I'm curious what you think the economists can give the state, or think they can give the state. Um, and why, and I'm wondering if the question is the Cold War, because initially we see them working on military projects, but they move towards civilian projects, which are 
which are kind of there because now the competition isn't about bombs after 56, it's about consumption. And consumption means increasing capital investments. And that's something they directly see. So is this something they understand as like working on kind of more the personal side, they understand is something they can give. Yeah, or is that the period you work on? Yeah. Consumption in particular? Uh, I work on Soviet economics and the ability and basically the, their input into the various reform legislation. Um, and the second question I have is whether we should be reading them through a kind of a Kotkonian or Helbeckian lens, if that means anything to someone. In other words, if we are seeing this relationship as a give or take of resources between the state and experts, we know the resources, especially like uh, European, or like uh, Leontief, I'm sorry, not Leontief, uh, Leontief, yeah, that he has this network, he has this plug into Khrushchev, and thus he can be the conduit for economic resources into this town. But what is this town giving the state again? Or do we just abandon that and kind of go for what Johann Helbeck would say is these, this guy is, it's not about networks, this guy is a true believer in communism and a true socialist or a true something, and that there's got to, we have to grapple with the personal belief. So, that's that. Okay, um, what do the economists do they give the state? Well, higher growth rates. Mm -hmm. I mean, simple, right? They, they, they made outrageous claims about the about the uh, amount to which they work with increased growth rates, mm -hmm. like completely absurd things. Um, also, one thing which we don't know anything about, um, someone has to figure this out, is the Central Economic Mathematical Institute and Institute of Problems of Control and the Mathematic, Institute of Mathematics of the Siberian Division of the Academy of Sciences um, all did a lot of what we in the US call operations research. Mm -hmm. um, so at, at SIMI, there's two floors that are, floors that are closed, and there's a like, special security desk that you mm -hmm. have to go by. Um, same thing as to problems of control. So there's floors in these institutes in which civilian, in which military research was going on, and I have no idea what it was. Um, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I have one story that uh, Lyapunov wrote like a game theoretic model of, um, of the arms race for the military, but like, I don't know what was going on. Um, so as, as to whether it's a give and take of resources or a sincere commitment, I have no reason to believe these things are incompatible. Um, uh, I, I am 100% convinced that Nemchinov and Kantorovich at least were consider themselves good socialists. And if you go and interview the remaining members of SEMI today, quite a few of them are still good socialists. Um, there are still pictures of them on the wall in their offices, um, and many of them still self-identify as socialists. But there's also just a question of patriotism, mm -hmm. aside from socialism aside. Right? And that yeah. can go well beyond mm -hmm. anyone. And then what becomes a question of what is socialism anyway? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? S.K. Lynn, Clarkson University. I have a question. You didn't mention the name of Pizza or Zandovich. Is that right? I did not mention the Pizza. Yeah, Kapitza was hung, arrested by Stalin before he was <coughs> released again because he need, Stalin needed him to build the bomb. Yeah. Zaldovich wrote a book on mathematical theory of combustions, and uh, I would assume you will weave them into your yeah. presentation and uh, extract some sort of a coherent uh, background or the social condition through which they live and come to work. Well, the, the physicist connection, I don't know if you guys have anything to add to this. I don't know that much about the physicists. Um, but there were two main places in which the mathematicians and the physicists interacted. One was through the bomb project and the rocketry project. Right, the yep. pizza was the bomb. Yeah. They call it the father right. of the bomb. <laughs> so it's crucially important to understand the reform of the sciences that happens over the next 20 years, that the mathematicians and the physicists sort of have a, a long interaction with each other and sort of allyship um, and um, have a lot of political power because of their success in these projects, right? Um, but it turns out that for whatever reason, the mathematicians seem more willing to take up administrative positions in the academy and had a lot more control over the shaping the direction of the academy. I don't know why. <coughs> it is true. So well, why so I had the opportunity to meet in well, his 70s. Well, I think you're right. Zarovic, whom I had the opportunity to have a personal conversation in his 70s, is so important in administrations. 
But he has to leave the conference early, and the governor sent a private jet to get him back home. You're right. They're very important. They're my politicians. They're very important in uh, the administration. Oh, no, I'm just what I was thinking of is that fortunately for physics, it's a much better research community. Most of the history that exists on the soil science, it's about either biology or it's about, or it would be about physics, it's about exactly yeah, what we're talking about. Yeah, Kapisa so is a very important scientist in Russia. Russia so we could because he will offer the position of Cavendish laboratory in England, Cambridge University, mm -hmm. he did not accept. He chose to go back home, to go back home to Russia, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. So he, that is a very important history. Was this on topic? Or yeah. Oh, please. There's another element to this. It's not as much in the 50s or 60s, but as the late 60s move along, physics kind of become, mathematics is involved with some ideological issues. And it actually becomes the fact that a lot of people who could be mathematicians or want to be abstract mathematicians wind up moving into physics because they are Jewish that they can't get those positions in mathematics. So physics kind of, applied physics especially, becomes kind of a place for them. I mean, I'm not a historian of science, I just know this from personal anecdotes that some of the people have told So why is physics more open than mathematics? I am not sure, but I think it might be because mathematics does still kind of carry an ideological connotation. There is still no ethics in it. I, I think it's also, it's also sometimes, sometimes the, the explanation is not that deep. Like Vinay Grado, who of mathematics, was just a rabid anti-Semite. Um, he was extremely proud of the fact that he had no Jews working under him. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't go down to the math. So the top of Kabbalah in physics, when Sakharov famously comments on anti-Semitism in physics, so I don't think there's much difference between mathematics and physics at this time. But there are very robust networks of Jewish or yeah. Jewish sympathizing mathematicians. That's so what uh, Slava. Yeah, so it's really thinking that Slava is not here because that's exactly yeah, that's exactly the you know works. so well. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think, yeah, so I think we could treat different institutions in different places different. Because, like in the Academy of Karadok, there is also a different synthesis, but it's operating different differently. Way. So it depends like where we would go and where we would look at it. Yeah, so. yeah. mine is mostly based yeah. on the one in front of people. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a question back here? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, no, I just wanted to say that. Uh, at some point, not long after the period that was under discussion, uh, the Soviets began to actively uh, use Vasily Leontiev and uh, input-output uh, medium models for economics. And in fact, they became the bedrock of Comic-Con's work uh, because, in fact, uh, linearization didn't present any, any problem for Marxism. I mean, all the problems for Marxism come precisely when you start to think non-linearly. Okay? <laughs> And uh, linearization is exactly. You could argue that it was the you could argue that it was the fact that they focused so strongly on linear models that was part of the disaster that common kind of came at the end of it. You know, you just double everything, that everything doubles, etc. And, uh, and uh, so Vasily was extremely popular in the Soviet Union and was often invited to lecture there and so on and to consult with people there. And I, I've run into people in mathematics years and years ago when I was young. I ran into people. In, Mathematical economics would work with Comic Con on I mean, the Eastern Bloc. And they, uh, they you know, it, 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 that was bread, their bread and butter stuff for them every day. Okay, so the day. three of us are going to talk yeah. afterwards because I'm writing the history of input output analysis of the Soviet Union and he's obsessed with Comic Con. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, the, there's some of his uh, Vasiliev's Leningrad accolades to have a think tank that still operates named after, that is named after Vasiliev that's trying to do regional planning based on linear programming. What's your name? Oh, I'm still at Capel. I'm at the club. Yes. Okay, a question. Um, Tom has me as a following energy. Um, back in the 50s and 60s in the United States, when we spoke about a computer, you could just as well be speaking of a digital electronic one as well as a electric mechanical analog computer. And when I first got into computers, I had to learn how to. You know, the workings of both types. Of course, the analog computer is kind of moved over to the, the simulators and training device, things like that. Uh, and of course, the digital computer is uh, essentially whatever the person can do with that. You carry it in your pocket, you can draw on it too. Um, in the Soviet Union, when they were speaking of computers in that same time period, were they kind of riding the coattails of the West, or did they have like, a separate development just 
Um, what was their mix of analog voices digital? So it's mechanical versus electronic. So um, initially they relied upon, uh, so when I say initially, I mean like 1930s, they're relying upon uh, imported mostly German analog computers. Um, during the war, they start to create a domestic analog computing industry um, and put a lot of work into that. Um, but then they also have this domestic digital computing, industry, digital electronic computing industry, which is, which you know, there's actually a bit, a fair amount written on, um, uh, and it, it was based on indigenous designs for the most part. And the early, um, the early Soviet computers were comparably powerful to the early American digital computers, um, but got based on their own designs. The second, which is a comment, is that the hydroelectric engineering, which is what our office in New York does. Um, many of our engineers trace back to the Soviet bloc, in Albania, uh, Romania, <coughs> uh, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, and Poland, and so on. And um, although obviously they were trained under whatever was the sound and good practices of engineering in the Soviet Union, uh, which I was kind of horrified when I visited some of the projects over there uh, as far as um, human factors. But when they came here to the U.S. and they got jobs in industry work with us, um, they were right there at the top of the rack with everybody else. And you have to learn, of course, the uh, practices here and regulations and different kind of government-private uh, interrelation. But um, I can say that you know, they um, did practice in the Soviet Union or the Soviet sphere to a point where they recognized there. Uh, they, did them, they did very well here. Um, something I've really wondered about is you talked a lot about the military connections early on, and um, and but you didn't necessarily entirely connect that to what you know what kind of comes out at the end, which is this totalizing concept of the economy. I've, I've done a lot of stuff on this on the on the American side. I've looked at, at the Rand Corporation uh, archives, for example. Did the Soviet military do anything like operational research, which is a kind of totalizing conception of, yeah, so of warfare? This is, this is a really uh, a really excellent question or something I'd really like to know about. I have found absolutely zero words written about it, um, but I know there were departments of operations research that were founded at universities, um, and the, uh, the Institute of Mathematics of the Siberian Division of the Academy of Sciences had a division of operations research. Um, the Institute of Problems of Control in Moscow basically was an operations research institute. Um, <laughs> but what you, what, I, what you find when you look at it, and only, this is only my first impression, so don't take it to mean all that much, um, was that it was less about the management of large complex um, projects, right, sort of like human machine assemblages of various sorts, um, than it was about the purely technical side. Okay. Right, like building building the, the weapon systems or the management systems for the weapons or the informational systems, um, much more than grasping the whole project. Mm -hmm. But I could be completely wrong in that because that's just the first impression. And there's nothing written about the Institute of Problems of Control except its own biography, which is actually pretty good. Um, and there's nothing written about these other departments that I've been able to find at all. And there's not a single article with the words history of operations research that I've been able to find in any language. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael, I'm on in half an hour. Um, I wanted to put Xenia's and Brittany's papers in a bit more direct conversation. So Xenia uh, finished by alluding to this idea of double loyalties in, within this domestic scientific space within the Soviet Union. Brittany, on the other hand, and particularly in the uh, question, um, this question about war, uh, war and peaceful applications, um, gives us another side of this double loyalties question, which is this idea for uh, building international rapport, but still maintaining a loyalty to this oppositional model of Cold War mathematics uh, and Cold War cooperation. Um, and so I wonder what, what more we can say about uh, the way this is reconciled among individual participants uh, and the effects this had on the institutional configurations that we saw. So one thing you see when you look at um, military-sponsored mathematical research in the 19, uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, is that by and large it's conceived as peaceful research. So peacetime military research is seen not as uh, a tool of war, um, but it's a tool for preventing war. Um, this is um, uh, something that other people are working on right now. Um, 
but but I, I do, do do reframings like that reconcile this appearance of a double loyalty, or is there something deeper going on? And what effects can you see by putting these two papers in conversation? I wonder if I may uh, give you my personal experience. Before I get my training from the university, out of blue, I get a call, telephone call from my naval research office and said that, uh, would you go to Wausau to attend this meeting? I said, what's the meeting about? He said, about the laser. I told him, I know nothing about this. My theory is full dynamics. He said, it doesn't matter. I said, what do I do? Is you go to that listen. And come back, give me a one page report. That's all you need to do. I said, I cannot say anything because it's outside my field. And then he said, well, you know, we are considering it for possible research. So at that moment, he hit my weakness. I was tempted <laughs> to really get the research done. <laughs> so I said, OK. If I cannot tell you anything sensible, it's your responsibility because I know nothing about this. It's OK. So I went. I come back. I give him one paragraph. I say, I listened to uh, carbon dioxide uh, laser. And that's all I said. But they were nice. They were nice about it. That is so-called, you have so-called loyalty. You, you have to tell the government what you hear, but you know, um, it's con it, it, it has something to do with so loyalty to the country which spoils the most of things. <coughs> in that meeting, actually, I met a lot of people. That's why I mentioned him, because he made such an important contribution on the question of even the, uni the origin of the universe. You may want to look it up. Well, um, actually, that's a perfect segue. So we're, we're almost out of time um, for this session. I think it's been a wonderful session. But I want to pray that all three of you have fascinating research um, from, from such different areas. And, and it's a pleasure to watch you all work it out here. Because this, this is a process now of figuring out what it might mean and how you pull connect the dots. Um, but speaking of commenting on other people's fields, things you know nothing about, that's my job. <laughs> and um, what, I, what I did want to talk about was the, um, this question of the, the relationship between uh, politics and power and the state on the one hand and the scientific project on the other. And I think it's central to all of, all of what you do. And you've all danced around it actually in really interesting ways because you've all refrained from the usual narrative. Now remember what the usual narrative is. If you read Soviet history right, and Russian history, it goes something like this. There's the purity of the mind. Uh, embodied in intelligentsia, uh, which suffers under the blows of one or another political power. And all they really want to do was pr uh, pursue uh, the purity of knowledge and, um, and of research. Um, however, is this a familiar narrative? To, 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 yeah. And so as they get slapped around by one or another cap capricious, obscure autocratic regime or uh, overly ideological Soviet regime, uh, they suffer and yet they persevere. Right? But none of you use that narrative, and I was, I was so glad to see that. And why was I so glad? Because you're actually engaging more directly this question of not so much uh, how the vis-a-vis -vis of power, uh, but the extent to which they contribute to and are products of that power. I mean, after all, which, if I already said there's one thing distinct, going back to what you were saying now, if there's one thing distinct about being a Soviet employee in a research institution, is that you are walking, breathing, and being paid by the state at every moment of the, of the uh, every step of the way. There is no outside. Right? It's, it's, you know, the correct institute may be implicated in official projects, but there's no such thing as being a private sector in the Soviet Union. There isn't one. Um, meaning, whatever you do is not, it's not simply that you're totalized, you're in a totalized state. You are the state at that moment. Um, and if you disagree with another part of the state, well, that's fissures and tensions within the state. It's not outside. And the, the absence of a vis a vis seems to me the, um, um, the way to proceed. And I think they're all proceeding that way already. Just to mm -hmm. qualify that a little bit, the, the self-image of the Academy of Sciences, though, is not entirely as a state institution, despite the fact that it obviously is, right? You have to walk me through this one. <laughs> um, so there's, obviously, the state of the Academy of Sciences is a state institution, right? But like, so Vera Toltz's work on it, um, you know, she's 
uh, I, think, I think it's her, or maybe the other day in class, I can't remember who I have in mind, um, notes that when the academy was resisting Bolshevization in the late 20s, it was because it viewed itself as an organ of international science. Mm -hmm. So it didn't view itself as having to submit to ideological pressures. Mm -hmm. And it's a remarkable the boldness with which it resisted these efforts, which was very, very ill-advised boldness. <laughs> um, but it only wouldn't have been so bold if it didn't think that this claim had some merit. Um, See, Bolshevization and standardization are not necessarily the same thing in that period. Um, so, um, these very same people are baiting the state for more resources. They're baiting the state to play a role in the state itself. Um, and that's what the academy does. Now, whether they're also communists and Bolsheviks is a different part. For the moment, it is. Later on, it becomes determined. Consider this. Um, Excuse me, with the intention of helping you, uh, Lebich, who was offered Einstein's professor chair at the City of University in the 1980s, mid 80s, was a period of time when the West tried to get many distinguished scientists from Russia, and he's one of them. And uh, Professor Bunch of Cambridge in England organized a petition. And I happened to sign my name on it. And that's, you may want to study that period to see how it relates to earlier period. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so uh, right now, uh, Fiona, who is responsible for all the good things that happened here, um, will, uh, where do we okay. go from here? So what's going to happen is we're going to pop out into the hallway, turn left, and <coughs> coffee is in room 222, uh, for lack of space. We're going to take a half an hour break, grab coffee, restrooms are down the hallway on the left-hand side just before the stairs. Um, if you need to take a smoke break, please do so. We'll reconvene here at 3.30. And Miles will reconvene us. Yeah. Sorry, can we? Yeah. 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 Y